Welcome to the vlog with a dog from New York, Boris. And I wanted to quickly detail my Digital Performer 11 startup template on the heels of the excellent webinar by Marco the Unicorn last Friday. Template Tips Part 2, hosted by Matt LaPointe, who made a lot of good points about efficiency and workflow in Digital Performer 11. So I wanted to quickly show my template, how I handle my needs in a pop music context. I don't do much soundtracks these days at all. I used to, but not anymore. So now it's a very trimmed down template. It clocks in at about 16 megabytes. The first thing I want to show is the bundles, because that's basically your environment, your studio environment. I have a couple mono bundles because there's a couple effects that seem to only want to have mono inputs for side chaining. So if I'm using those effects, then I need to bus the kick to this mono send and then I can use it for side chaining. I have a sub mix that's basically all the tracks going before the mix bus. This goes into the mix bus. Just if I need one more instance to control things. Real time recorders for real time recording. Uh, in the old days, I don't really do that much anymore, but it used to be issues with some plugins when they were retardandi or other tempo changes. It's an old habit. Then here's my pop music stuff. Kick, usually stereo now for various reasons. Snare, clap, highs is my cymbal aux, but there's also swooshes and sound effects sounds that are kind of in the higher frequency spectrum. All those go into all capital drums and percussion. And then bass and bass layers if there is any. Sometimes I want an aux for the bass layers. And those go into all caps bass. I could group drum, drums and bass together if I need to. That aux is ready and properly named. Then I have a lead vocal aux bring not only the leads in there, but usually also the vocal doubles route in there. And then background vocals one, background vocals two are ready to go, parallel vocals. I might rename this once I use it for something, then I will name it whatever it is that I'm using it for, like distortion or whatever. Then vocals all caps, meaning all these route into that. That's the last instance to control them somehow. Melodic synths, chordal synths also go into all cap synths. Sierra Epic, I have a whole aux for it that's already kind of set up also with automation, simply because it's a very easy plugin to use for Time efficiency if there's a deadline. It has four delays and four reverbs, and I already have automation lanes ready for all of them. Because if, if I am using CLI Epic, then you know it's gotta be automated because you don't want the verses as wet as the choruses. Just having it static is not really a modern way of mixing. But I also created those myself as separate auxes with different plugins. You know, not CLI Epic, but Valhalla and various other options that I have on here. These I can use and change as needed and desired. The beautiful thing about having separate auxes, of course, is that I can have just volume curves and have them easily adjust. This is kind of what I did with the CLI Epic, but since they're all in the same plugin, it gets a little bit more tedious maybe to find things. Here you can see them very quickly. And I already have the volume curves drawn in, as you can see, because sometimes I see myself doing the same thing over and over again, and aren't computers about not doing that but saving time. And, you know, for some things like delays, certain type of delay, like an eighth note delay, I often increase it as we reach the chorus and then have it bumped up in the chorus tremendously, then go dry again. So I thought to myself, why not have some kind of prefab curve already in there in every project? Because I see myself doing this over and over again. I love automating auxes, as you can see. This is the actual template. We have an unused folder. It's pretty self-explanatory. I have things like beeps in there and countdowns, which helps creating mixes for music video filming. So people have like two bars of counting. If it starts playing right away, you're not really in position. So having a little countdown or click is really useful. In the flute folder, I put tracks that are frozen. At the mix stage, I like to have everything audio and not virtual instruments anymore. And so then those virtual instruments will be dragged in here once they're frozen and the frozen track will be up here. Instruments, these are instruments that are ready to go, including MIDI device groups, some basic grooves even in here already on most of these instruments, some hi-hat patterns in there. Device groups meaning that I could experiment with different instruments and have them all just triggered by this. I have a few more instruments here that I might use, some drums and percussion instruments ready to go. Others I offloaded to clippings, some synths, some of my favorite synths are in here, just ready to go. You know, and the way I did it at the time is I would have a MIDI track and then I already had a prepared freezer track. So I could just give us a proper name and the audio file would have the proper name. And then my aux buses, I have all my 
vocal and some vocal tracks also ready to go and all these buses that I mentioned. Everything we saw in the bundles. I also have these as clippings as well. So if I wanted to drag those in, here they are. I could do so in an older project that was created long before I had this intricate bus matrix assignment. When I do that, I would have to first import the bundles. You know, what you do is clear and import bundles and then you could import all these bundles into the old project. And then I would drag over the auxes and then they would show up properly assigned. And then I could use those and that's basically my studio. So I could convert an old project rather easily. The way I like to work is I like to work in phases. So I have my production phase where I drag things up here. And I like to th have things pretty slim up here in this working area. There's more stuff here than is shown right now because it's disabled. All these auxes and the primary auxes and some you know vocal tracks are there. If I enable everything, this is really what it would look like. It's a little too cluttered for starting a new project. I only want to see the piano and vocal tracks because that's usually how I start. But then soon as I start to flesh out a song, instead of going to the aux folder and dragging each one of these up, I already left those here. At least that's a new approach now that I'm experimenting with for the last two weeks. There's always a compromise between having this area too cluttered. Because then once the mix phase comes, I only want to enable everything here and not have anything here that's not enabled. The reason for that is just that I know that everything here is all there is. And I can just enable everything, the mixing board, like that. You know, taking out the disabled tracks, because I always have a disabled tracks beside the vocal. So I can experiment with effects. When I have to overdub something, I want no issues. Some effects give me issues, like isotope effects can have incredible latency issues. So then I drag those into the disabled one, and then I record, and then when I'm ready to actually mix, then I put those back. Certain plugins are just not good to run in real time, it seems like. In the mix phase, I like to have this all neat. And then at some point, I can narrow it down by just really looking at the auxes. That's like the final stage of the mixing. In a separate step, I will do a mastering. I hope this was helpful and further fuels the dialogue about this interesting topic that's of such incredible importance, I think, for anybody who wants efficiency. Take care and thank you for watching. All right.